begin our program once again. We seek your blessings on each one of us. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Lyle. As we know, that topic for today is liber text. And you must be wondering what it is. Our guest, Dr. Josh, will talk about it in detail. But before that, I invite Dr. Archana Kapoor to briefly tell us about this. Dr. Kapoor. Thank you. We extend a very warm welcome from the BA department and the Isabella Thoban family to our resource person for today, Professor Josh Halpburn, who is the outreach team chair of Libertech. And we are very fortunate to have Professor Josh amongst us. And we thank you for giving your precious time. And it's early morning over there. We are more comfortable in the evening out here in India. So we really appreciate for taking out time from uh, your busy schedule to share your views and enlighten us on this particular theme that is Libertex. When Dr. Joseph told us about this, it just struck me, what exactly is it? So I did a bit, little bit of search, but all I could gather, uh, which I'll be briefing just now, was that it means free the textbook. As I mentioned initially, it seemed to me that free one from the textbook, but over here it is regarding giving opportunity with the cost factor and making available online material for the students. So what I gathered was that Libertext is a non-profit organization. I hope I'm correct, Professor Josh. And it is committed to freeing the textbook from the limitations and cost of traditional textbook. Then uh, this project, it provides open access to its content on its website and the site is built on MindTouch platform. Uh, Professor Josh will enlighten us further regarding and uh, throw his expertise on this. It is one of the largest and most visited online educational resources. This open and freely accessible Libertex provides a more engaging learning experience for students without any financial burden. That's really wonderful. This helps to decrease the cost of college textbooks while increasing the availability, usage, and educational value of open textbook. That was all I could really understand because it is something, uh, you know, a, a kind of a new venture for all of us. Uh, uh, and uh, we are very thankful to you that you are going to throw light upon this and with that, we again, once again, welcome you and we invite you to address us, Professor Josh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. I think I've prepared the usual PowerPoint deck. And uh, if I can share my screen. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Dr. Josh, I would like to introduce you to the students first. Okay. They should, they should know you're like, so much of work has been done by you. So it will be a privilege for them to know about you. And I request Dr. Roma Joseph, who is the coordinator of this program, to formally introduce our guest speaker to the students. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajan. And it is indeed my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Joshua Helfern to especially all our students who are very enthusiastic to uh, enthusiastic to learn from him and uh, are waiting for his presentation, actually. So Professor Josh uh, Halpern spent many years as a professor of chemistry at Harvard University and now retired. He proselytizes for open educational resources and the benefits they bring to students and teachers. In addition to his scientific research over the years, he led a number of educational projects in the United States. He was the founding director of the DC Space Grant Consortium 
and administered the NASA God Space Flight Center Faculty Fellowship Program from 1990 and from 2006. He designed, led, and nurtured a number of projects which brought together a wide range of colleges and universities, from community colleges to research universities to improve education for underrepresented groups in the United States. He joined Liberitech in 2013 and today is a part of project management. So it's our big privilege to have him here with us to share a wonderful open educational research that is Liberitech and also as teacher educators and teacher trainees, how we can use the research right from the primary, primary level to the higher level of education. So it's a big warm welcome to Professor Helper. And now I invite him for his presentation. Professor. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Uh, let me, uh, you're going to have to let me share the screen. Yes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, wherever here, here is these days. Uh, I'm actually taking part now in, and I think I met Dr. Joseph there, in one of these global conferences that goes 24 seven around the world. Uh, it's different, let's put it that way. Uh, so let me start the slideshow. First, can you hear me clearly? That's always a problem yes. with these. So I'm representing Libertex today. And there's some, uh, I've shared the presentation with Dr. Roma Joseph and there's some contact information there. And there's some contact information for me as well. Uh, we have sponsorship from a number of organizations. Our principal sponsorship at the moment is from the United States Department of Education, but we're also developing online homework systems with the California Learning Lab program. And we've had support, we have support now from NASA and from NSF. Our mission is to free the textbook. This has multiple meanings. We want to free the textbook from cost, but that's relatively unimportant. We want to make the textbook the textbook you need for your students and for your classes. So I thought I'd start by just defining what OER is. They're basically free and openly licensed educational materials. Uh, the definition people have been using was developed about 15 years ago by the William and Flora Unit Foundation. But last year, UNESCO uh, brought the definition up to date. They're teaching, learning, or research materials that are in the public domain or released with intellectual property licenses that facilitate free use, adapt adaptation, and distribution. So Libertext is independent. We're nonprofit. We just uh, incorporated in California. We started in 2008 at the University of California, Davis. This is a project that was started by Delmar Larson. Right now, we have a network of about 20 institutions, and we have more than 200 faculty involved in program project governance, and thousands of faculty are actually building textbooks. We'd like you to join us. We think it's incredibly exciting to uh, have some people from India join us. As I'll show you later, about 20% of the people who visit Libertex are from India. And to join us, if you're a faculty member, uh, there's a form that you can fill out at chinaurl.com slash register for Libre. So we're a community and we're a community building free resources for you that are comprehensive K through 12, through gray kind of courses that you, my mom always used to take courses. Uh, usually they were, uh, mom, mom was pretty old. She would get books of courses, but they are living. So they, they can be changed to meet new needs. We just hit our half a billion site visit level. 
we get about 100 million page views per year. Uh, we're running at about uh, 12 million page views per month now because of the COVID emergency. And we're the most visited OER project on the net outside of the Wikipedia. That, that's really big. So let me talk about textbooks. Historically, textbooks are the most used educational resource. But the, the availability and the cost of textbooks and the rigidity of textbooks has really become debilitating for students. It's fun to think back about why we have copyright and how long textbooks have been around. Maybe the earliest textbook was Panini Sutras uh, on Sanskrit grammar. Mechanical printing came around in the end of the 15th, uh, beginning of the 16th century, but it was limited by law. This is dangerous stuff. Can't allow anybody to just print anything they want. And we see continuations of that in this century. But copyright was an invention of the 18th century designed to protect the rights of creators. In a market economy, they protect commercial rights. And the balance between protecting the rights of creators and protecting commercial rights has unfortunately, in my opinion, shifted in the past 100 years or so. Okay, so we have this procession from scribes to printers to photocopiers to digitization for printed textbook material. I thought I've, in preparing for this cause, for this uh, talk, uh, I came across this quote from a Delhi High Court decision. And it says, it's not, copyright's not a natural, divine, or a natural right. It's designed to stimulate activity and progress in the arts, and I might add sciences to this, for the intellectual enrichment of the public. Copyright is intended to increase and not to impede the harvest of knowledge. It's intended to motivate the creative activity of authors and inventors to benefit the public, not to enrich the printers. Well, Creative Commons is an organization that's trying to bring this kind of idea to the fore. They've defined an open copyright called a Creative Commons copyright. And I thought for a discussion of open educational resources, it would be good to talk about the Creative Commons licenses. Uh, they come in many flavors and it's very confusing. And they are not the only open license, but they are the most common open license for printed textbooks. So the first level is no restrictions, okay. And the next level is called CCBY and it means you have to acknowledge authors. And then you can have CCBYSA, which means it must have the same license as the original. So you can't take something that's licensed and make it more restrictive. Then we come to problems. The most common problem is the uh, non-commercial clause that it can't be sold directly or used for profit. And then there's another clause that you can copy it, you can distribute it, but you can't alter it. So no derivatives allowed. And finally, we come to the normal copyright. I'd like to talk about the NC license a bit. Some of our material is NC licensed, a lot of it actually. And there's a confusion about what it is. So, We've recently come across a discussion, we've been involved in a discussion, what is this? Can a for-profit school or for-profit organization use it? And Creative Commons answered and they said, as long as it isn't the primary motive or incentive for charging tuition, it can be used under the NC licenses. I think that's gonna be important. But also everybody agrees that if you have something that's NC licensed, and you charge for the cost of reproduction, for printing, what have you. There's no commercial advantage in that. And that doesn't violate the NC license. So in the, con in the North American context, freeing the textbook is discussed in the context of cost. 
we maintain that cost is not the problem. Cost is the problem only insofar as it prevents students from flourishing. So it means freeing the textbook means making sure students get access to the textbooks and access to textbooks that speak to them. What has been brought home to us, though I assume it's clear to just about everybody else, is that OER allows you to provide content in multiple formats, which match what the students can have access to. Many students lack electronic devices, many students lack internet access, and many students lack electricity. That's true even in the United States in certain isolated communities. In terms of the UN Sustainable Development Goal, we're very interested in contributing to the fourth goal, making sure that everybody has quality education. OER can get that for us. So when you start digging in again, mostly in the North American contents, but also in Europe, Japan, whatever, uh, textbooks are very important and the question, uh, very expensive. And the question is, why are they so expensive? The reason they're expensive is that the person who pays the student is not the person who orders. So textbook marketing was marketing to faculty. And we have to be very careful about this because there are lots of ethical issues here. Publishers market to faculty by providing other services. In the US, this is particularly homework systems now. Uh, and the faculty then force the students to purchase the homework system and the publisher prices the homework system so high that students fear they might as well buy the textbook or a license to read the textbook. So OER needs to meet these challenges. OER has to provide these ancillary services which help faculty create material or use material that's free to their students and is ideal for their students. Now, let me talk a little bit about Libertex in India. Turns out that India provides about 22, well, 23%, 20%, depends on the library of the site visits that Libertex has. Uh, there are many other countries. As a matter of fact, it's pretty hard to find a country where we don't have at least some users, even Greenland. So what's important to us is availability, the right to reach content. We, have a, we operate under the MindTouch system. This is a commercial system. It uh, provides us 99.4 uptime. It's available in the cloud. So if you use Libertext, you don't need to provide your, local, your own local IT or purchase it from a third party vendor. How do we support it? Well, we go out and we hustle. We get grants, we get uh, support. We have a button that says contribute. Uh, and essentially, the MindTouch system is viewable on any HTML5 capable device. When I taught, I would come in to my class and I would see my students on their phone. And if I walked down the aisle, I would see that about three quarters of them were looking at my lecture. Uh, so that's important. Uh, all of our Libertexts are one click importable to a local LMS. I assume you have a le learning management system of some sort, but I don't know what it is, but, but it's a fairly simple pro process. You can print any page as a PDF uh, and all of the books are available as files updated from our download center for just-in-time printing. Uh, I assume you can see this. This is a general chemistry book. Actually, it's one of the ones that I contributed to. We built a, uh, with some people at Prince George's Community College, we built a special book for engineering students. Now, one of the cute things as, that we've done is the, tech, the, the online textbook has the ability to show videos, but you can't show a video in a printed textbook. What you can do is embed a QR code so that if somebody has a cell phone, they can point it at the QR code and get the video. And we're continually looking for things like this. 
But as I said, the problem with online OER is not everybody has connectivity. So we have a bookstore where people can come in and get a book. They can search by author, they can search by institution, they can search in any of our libraries. We have 13 libraries. Uh, if you select a book, you can then view it online, you can download a PDF, you can go to your learning management system, or you can buy a print copy. Uh, before we started, we were discussing, we print through a North American printer called Lulu, it's an online printer. Uh, you can get a book fairly inexpensively. This is a few hundred page book and it costs about $12 US. There are such printers in India. Uh, you can have access to them. Uh, I was talking with one of them just a few months ago. So uh, we, we will now explore that in more detail for you. Anyhow, we're looking for other ways of customized dissemination. We can take a Raspberry Pi, which is a small, inexpensive computer. It comes either in its own box or you can get it in a keyboard now. These are kind of cute. Uh, and we can put essentially all of Libertex there. And you can take this and you can uh, bring in a Wi-Fi hotspot. You can bring in a, excuse me, a second. I don't see it right away. You can bring in a, oh, there it is, yeah. Small solar cell. And you can run this in any remote area. You can download the information onto a uh, SD, SD card. One of the things that I think is really, really going to be useful for Libertext and for others is you could download any number of books onto an SD card. They're not very expensive these days. And you can then take this SD card and put it in an envelope and mail it to students. We're building a translator into EPUB format. That's a very common format. And we're working with a group called Kiwix, who has built uh, Wikipedia in a box to build an app for cell phones using their ZIM files. And that will bring more set functionality to the cell phone than we have now. So we think diverse distribution channels are very important. We're interested in finding other ways of bringing content to faculty and students. And one of the reasons for this is we're very worried by the fact that students, when they buy licenses or they buy textbooks now, sell them back. And that means they don't have a library. And we find that to be educationally bad. It has awful consequences. So let me come back to my theme. Free the textbooks, not only about cost. It means providing students textbooks that speak to them, freeing the curricula from the printed textbook straitjacket, building tools to create custom materials for courses and students. When we talk to faculty or when people who do surveys talk to faculty, uh, the Babson survey really does a good job in the North American context. Why don't faculty adopt OER? Because they can't find it. Because there's no comprehensive catalog of resources. Uh, my uh, colleague, Delmar Larson, says they need swamis. They, they need guides to tell them where this stuff is. There's a lot of stuff out there. And they need these ancillary services to support them. Your there are a lot of faculty on this call. Uh, what do, how do faculty find textbooks lacking? Well, you buy a textbook and you, you've bought their table of contents. A lot of times you just skip sections. You teach in different order. You replace content with your own material, uh, duplicated somehow, photocopied. Uh, you find other sources online. You correct inaccuracies. Once a textbook is printed, uh, it's printed. 
<laughs> you can't change it very much. I, we do update our textbooks files every week, but in general, printing of textbooks occurs every two or three years. And students hate all of this stuff. So the major advantage of OER to us is that it's living. You can remix it, reuse it, and revise it to fit your course objectives, to fit, to make your course materials inclusive of your students. We pay some, we pay attention to uh, accessibility, usually discussed in terms of how, can students who have some sort of physical disability, uh, low sight, uh, low hearing, uh, gain access to the material. We have a team that works on this constantly. But we've done some things. For example, if you use that blues, the blue bar on the right, you can make the print larger. You can increase the margins to make it easier to read. We have in integrated within our system something called a beeline reader, which, for example, you can read it in a dark mode. Some people find that easier. Or, for example, you could outline phrases so it's broken up more easily. This is uh, useful to people who are a bit dyslexic or, for example, who uh, are learning English as a second language. Okay. So customizable for your course and your students. When I talk about OER, we generally talk about three kinds of OER sites. Referatories, which are basically piles of links to other resources that are elsewhere. Uh, and these links are at the mercy of uh, dead links. The URL changes. A repository. Well, repositories can be in formats like PDF that are difficult to edit. It's stable, but it's dead. And finally, a platform is an infrastructure that allows you to create OER. Uh, and it's typically collected to a repository. And that's what Libertex are, is. We're a platform with a repository. So the usual way that people think about uh, OER sites is that the faculty member finds a resource that's really good and sends the URL to his or her students, and the students go to the library and read it. But they, these don't really provide what's needed. And if you're <coughs> doing this locally, there are high operating costs, and they also suffer from Likrat. So here are the things we're trying to solve. And of course, if there are any administrators here, please, if your faculty members develop OER, give them credit. So what do I mean by textbooks or straitjackets? Well, these are two chemistry textbooks. I used to teach chemistry. Uh, and if you look through the table of contents, they're exactly the same. We wanna have living content. Uh, when I was a student, when you bought a textbook, you got an errata sheet. And of course, textbooks, that's my textbook, that's my chemistry textbook. Here are some modern ones. And now we have PDFs, and PDFs are a horror to edit. So we think that textbooks need to become learning centers, learning centered. They need to provide the text material, but also other things that faculty members want to use to teach their students and students want to learn from. So the textbook of the future is a system, not a book. So here's our faculty member, and there's our library. And there are the students. We have surrounded our libraries with an annotation system so students can annotate their text. They can do that either privately or it can be in an open way so everybody sees it and starts a discussion. We're building homework systems. 
We have Jupyter Notebooks. These are uh, enable you to actually do computation within the uh, textbook, within the Libertex. JavaScript servers do the same thing. We can provide learning analytics. We can correct things across the entire library with a automatic curation service. And we have the beginnings of an LMS. We have an LMS, a way of actually communicating with your LMS. So instead of going to Libertex, the students can go to their LMS. Uh, I don't know what you use, Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, these are all popular ones. To make this work, you've got to make life easy for instructors. Display in any, we can display in any language that Unicode handles. Uh, I, I understand that Dr. Joseph has actually done some things in Hindi in her sandbox. We have drag and drop remixing. So you can take any page from anywhere and put it into your textbook. We have automatic generation of indices and tables of contents. We have global and local glossaries, community support, and an institutional network. When you turn on Libertext, uh, you can go to any one of the libraries. This has changed a little bit. Uh, and they look the same. And what we have are bookshelves and courses. The bookshelves are books that are centrally curated. The courses are books or Libertex that you create and curate for your own students and yourself. There's zero cost online. It does cost to print, I mean, but, but it's pretty low. Uh, they're always available, 99.4% uptime, uh, no registration needed, and uh, okay. So if you want to build a book, you have to register for Libre and you get access to a sandbox where you can create the book. The bookshelves, this is the K through 12 library. We just opened it, uh, contains original material, OER textbooks that have been created in Libretext or in other libraries and what we call maps, which are page for page uh, maps to commercial textbook content uh, using OER materials. So there's no copyrighted material, but you get the same information for your students. We have courses that are locally curated and customized. And customization we think is central to OER. Into your courses, you can bring books from the bookshelves exemplars, worksheets, homework exercises, you can integrate uh, videos, you can do lots, you can put lots of different kinds of materials in there. So we have a, a fairly, I don't know if I wanna use the word simple, but a fairly common type of editor that you can use. We have a remixer and you can essentially drag anything from here over here and then build it into your book. It's flexible. So somebody sends us email and say, hey, this would be really nice. And we can put it in. Our homework system is a little bit different. We're not creating so much an independent homework system as we're taking other homework uh, systems that are available. And we're making middleware so that any problem from any of these homework systems can be used in Libertex and then communicated, the grading communicated back and forth to your uh, gradebook. So it kind of looks like this. Uh, we're building, <coughs> sorry. We're building a uh, homework system where you can, it's not machine learning, but it's uh, what's called AI. Uh, basically it's a linear model. So you can build the network. you get this question right. You go on to the next topic. If you don't, you get another question. Uh, then you get a tutorial uh, and you go back and forth this way and you, essentially build a learning tree. Actually, this is also drag and drop. So it's, it's not as scary as it looks. 
Okay, so we've got the things ready. Uh, in summary, we have all kinds of material uh, and it can be used by faculty with minimal computer experience. You don't have to be a programmer. Uh, and it's set up so that we can have sandbox team sandboxes so you can work collaboratively and lots and lots of technical features. We've built, we're building an ecosystem. That's kind of the end. I'm going to, uh, these are the information systems. Now, what I want to do here very briefly is here is uh, just very briefly before we go to questions. Uh, this is the social sciences library. Uh, I think we have lots of books in early childhood education. Uh, don't oh, know. Uh, let me just pick one here. These are individual chapters. Now, one interesting feature here is let's say I want to annotate this. I can put an annotation there. I can highlight it. If I'm registered, then the highlighting will be saved. Uh, I can print the full book or I can print the page. Uh, this, and I have this blue bar over here. Uh, for example, let's say you want to cite this page. Or let's say you want to find out what license you have. There are lots of other things here. Uh, we have 14 libraries now. We have forums to discuss materials. We have a YouTube channel. Let me go to the YouTube channel. Uh, let me turn that off. Uh, we've had some uh, workshops. So for example, you can learn how to do different things. Uh, these are the summer videos. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of tutorials there. Um, okay. I'm, I'm giving myself five more minutes because I want to uh, give you time to ask questions. If I sign in, I can go to my sandbox. And then I have access to a construction guide, training tutorials, and other things. Now, if I go to my sandbox here, I just want to show you briefly the remixer. I have to give it a name. Let's say I want to get something off the bookshelf in early childhood education. Let's say here. So I'll bring this chapter over here. And I'll say, bring another chapter over. I don't want to take too much time. Right. Yeah, my, my mouse is do, doing evil things to me. Yeah, my mouse has done evil things to me. Something. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> so I'll do for some reason. Okay, so I can. Let me see if I can do this. So there's a chapter. I want to get another chapter. Here. Okay. All right. So I'm not having such good luck with that. I can 
get rid of this. This is not the system. This is my... Uh, notice that the numberings changed. Uh, in any case, I'm going to save this to the server. You can see the book is now actually being compiled. Now it's done. And now it's in my sandbox. There's the book. And if I look at it, It looks like ordinary text, but in fact, if I edit it, you'll see that it's just a pile of links. So the question is, how can I make this so that I can actually see the text? And we have this thing called forking. So if I hit that fork there, And now I go to edit, you'll see the text is there. And you can change this any way you want using the editor. And uh, one other thing. Okay. So now let's assume that I want to go back here. Since it's a pile of links, if somebody changed what was on the bookshelf, you wouldn't know that. But if you hit the star here, you'll get an email message when anything changes. So that's all there. Uh, and one other thing I wanted to show you, uh, let's come over here. We have now a K through 12 library with uh, different things here. We could put a we could put a, a bookshelf area for materials that you develop. Uh, let's take a look at the mathematics. So this comes to us courtesy of the CK12 Foundation. So there's lots to explore. I would encourage you to explore if you are interested in getting a uh, an account. Okay, where, where did I put the accounts? Ah, oh, yes. Okay, so I put that somewhere where I can't find it. Okay. Anyhow, it's tiny URL register for Libre. Uh, and with that, if there are questions, <clears throat> happy to answer. Yes, I would now request Dr. Jha to take yeah. over. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Joseph. Now is the time for questions. Students are requested and they are welcome now to ask questions. Please unmute yourself and ask question. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Hello. Sir, how to ascertain the authenticity of the open resources that are available on the internet, sir? Well, they're open, so you have to find them. What are, you, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to read them or are you trying to make? make Sir, so if we want to access the open uh, resources that are available on the internet, so how will we find out their authenticity, sir? What do you mean by authenticity? Sir, so 
so are the open resources sir, that are available are are they easy to access sir can we access yes. it yes okay first in the first case first place and i'm going to take the screen share back again okay okay so you raise a number of issues uh, you can You can just go to libertex.org. And then, for example, you can go to any of the libraries. So, for example, you could go to the humanities library. Now, you can uh, then access any of the things that are here. You can go to if you go to down here, you can go to any of the libraries. Uh, the courses, then for example, <clears throat> you can go to basically any of the courses This, this book hasn't been completed yet. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit spotty. Um, now, I thought you were raising a very important question, which is slightly different than what I finally figured out you were asking. But it, it's all tied together. How do you know that any of this material is any good? The material that we keep in the bookshelves, we curate. So we stand behind it. Uh, material that we, that is in the course shelves, you will see this if you're not signed in as an instructor. The material in the course shelves is curated by the people who created have created the course. So in the, they have to stand behind that. There are other repositories and referatories that each have different ways of dealing with this. For example, uh, there's a there's a group called OpenStax that concentrates on providing courses, whoops, wrong thing. Uh, they concentrate on, never go to somebody else's uh, sandbox. Okay. They provide courses that have large enrollment and they're generally beginning courses. And right now, they have an online presence, but they're getting rid of it, and they're going to only providing printed textbooks, printed textbooks at low cost. So they, they operate much more like a traditional publisher who uh, evaluates their material. There are other referatories, um, Open Textbook Network, uh, for example, that provides reviews. They actually pay for reviews by faculty members of different textbooks. There's uh, an organization called Pressbooks that uh, provides open textbooks and they also provide limited reviewing. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir, indeed, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Good questions? morning, sir. Good morning, sir. So my question is, how can students from remote areas access these open resources when internet availability is not stable? Okay, well, I'll give you, 
three answers to that. Sure, um, sir. And I think we Libertex is a leader in this area. In the first case, we're developing Libertex in a box where you can essentially download, go to a place where there is internet connectivity or use spotty internet connectivity to download the books or books that you want onto an SD card that you put, that is in, or you put in to a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pis are extremely inexpensive. Uh, in US dollars, they're about $35. Uh, this device over here, which contains the keyboard and some other things, uh, might be another $70 to $100 US. Uh, you can get a Wi-Fi hotspot. You can get uh, you don't, if you have trouble with electricity, you can get a solar cell and you can run the system. Now, it depends on what your students have for devices. So I think that even in remote locations, a lot of people have um, cell phones. Is that true? Yes, sir. So basically, this device will then... Uh, communicate with the cell phones, the Wi-Fi hotspot. You could alternatively get a friend somewhere to download the material onto an SD card, and you can load the SD card directly into the cell phone to get access. We're building an app. Uh, they have started scraping all of our content now. Uh, so, <clears throat> building an app so that the cell phones can gain access to some of the uh, materials, uh, the videos and the uh, simulations and other things that are in the Libertexts. You can get a book printed. Uh, a just in time, are, are you familiar with just in time printing? Yes, sir. Yeah, so th these are basically photocopiers who have huge photocopying machines, and they can print a book at very low costs uh, and then mail it to you or your students. And we're interested in any other ways that people might think of. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I have one uh, query. Isn't uh, a, like a project, like a platform, like Libertex, a threat to big publishing houses? No, we don't. They can. <laughs> because are we connected I, to a publishing house? Like, isn't it a threat? Because in future, what I can foresee that it many publishing houses will close down. Yeah, they're closing down, but we're we're not connected to a publishing house. No, no, I'm just saying that I. Uh, it seemed it might be a threat to big publishing houses because they. Oh, it is. Yes, they are beginning to pay attention. <laughs> uh, and question number two is. Hang on a second. Uh, okay. Let me, <coughs> let me find something. Uh, I'll put it in the chat here. The um, damn it. Ah, damn it. So there's this organization, they changed their name. If you do a search, survey research group. Uh, 
if you do a search on Babson Survey Research Group, you will find reports that discuss this in very great detail. Okay. They've recently changed their name, but you'll find it still with that search string. Okay. I, th I think what happened is they, they were associated with Babson College and they've gone independent. Okay, yes. So one more uh, query that came to my mind is that there might be many books or material uh, which may not be available through Libertex because they might have very strong copyright issues, etc. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in part, and I'm going to grab the screen again. Okay, so. Oh, this is, okay. So what we've done, remember I always showed you um, that um, Barrier. basically the uh, textbooks all have the same uh, table of contents. We have this idea, it's called a text map. And what a text map is, this book is copywritten. Okay. But what we've done is we've taken the table of contents and for every section of the table of contents, we've found material that answers the same, contains the same information. Okay, okay. So while it's, while it's not a, actually this, this is something that I found. Um, while it's not word for word what's in the copywritten textbook, it does contain the same information. Okay. We so call these, yeah, we call these text maps. Okay, okay. So that's a wonderful, like, kind of initiative. Yeah, it, it, it helps. You get the same information to study, but it doesn't cost you. Uh, in, in a different manner. Yeah. Very true. Any more questions, students? I think I should come to this. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, sir for answering those questions and giving so much of time. Thank you. Now, oh, it was, it was only an hour. Of this program. On behalf of the students and faculty of Teacher Education Department of Isabella Thoburn College, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Professor Joshua Helpert for such an enlightening, informative, and interesting presentation on Libertex free the textbook that is making available educational resources online, which is so relevant, especially nowadays. My sincere thanks to Dr. E. S. Chang, President Isabella Thoburn College for her encouragement and support. I would also like to thank our principal, Dr. V. Prakash for her guidance and support at each step. My thanks are due to the organizing committee for choosing such relevant topics for these online lecture series. Thanks to all the participants, our students, for being a part of this program and making it so relevant and also making it so uh, easy to understand and beneficial for them. Once again, I would like to thank Professor Helper for giving so much of time. I know the time is convenient for us, but not for you. I can understand that, sir. But thank you so much for giving your so much precious time to us and making it so easy for us to understand and such a valuable thing. Thank you so much once again. Yes. Thank, thank you. So you. Much. And I'd like to thank, thank Dr. Joseph for organizing this and 
if you need to contact me, she has my email. Right person. Thank you. Your email, and we know that so we, much that as we work on Libri Tech, Professor Halpern is there to help us and guide us. And yes. we, uh, we would definitely be contacting you. We'll contact you regarding the customization, redistribution, and organization of the OER on LibreTech. Once again, a big, big thanks to the Mission LibreTech and to the entire team of LibreTech, <laughs> uniting students, faculty, and scholars in a cooperative effort to develop an easy to use online platform for the construction, customization, and dissemination of OER to reduce <laughs> the funds of broadcast to our students and society. And with this, we end this stream. Thank you so much. Have a great time.